Welcome. Uh, because we're working with visual culture here, uh, we have some slides that we want to show. And I think that in order for us to enjoy them as well, we need to move. So the three of us, I think, are going to move over here. And we're going to begin with uh, slides from uh, Liana's new book, Let There Be Light. We'll move slowly so we don't shock you. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> Can you hear me if I'm like not facing you? Why don't you stand up? I'm oh yeah. <laughs> yes, this is better. Um, so this is an excerpt from my adaptation of the book of Genesis. And here is Noah. When God looked down from her heavenly haunts, she saw the wickedness of man, that everything he thought, I wonder if there is a kegger I can crash tonight and everything he felt. I'm going to sleep with my neighbor's wife. Murder, 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 murder. <laughs> Was downright evil. It grieved her. And she's thinking, why can't I sleep? Oh, yes, men. She knew she would not be able to sleep until she destroyed them. There's a certain relief that comes with making a decision, even a horrendous one. There was, however, one man of whom God was very fond. His name was Noah. And because God, um, according to Jewish law, um, God is not someone whose face you see. She's hiding behind the moon. Hi, she says. I am the Lord your God. I've made a decision. I am going to destroy the world. And I can't imagine a world without you in it. She told him to build an ark, and she says, make it about yay big. When it's finished, I want you to round up two of every kind of animal and bring them inside. And he looks a little disgruntled about that. Just hurry. The floods are coming. And you get a preview of the flood by the tear in her eye. This is the story of God's first love. God loved Noah. She loved him at a time when she hated everything else, including herself. She didn't want to destroy the world. She simply couldn't help herself. But by the time the rains came, and she's weeping, Noah, his family, and the animals were all safe on board the ark. Our heroine cried for 40 days and 40 nights. God's love of her creations had eroded imperceptibly over time. There had been the episode with the, t with the tree of knowledge and the terrible murder of Abel by Cain. But it wasn't until now that the misery poured out of her in all its brutal force. In other ways, though, she was profoundly happy. The way she felt about Noah, it was a new way to feel. As for Noah, who knows if he felt it too? He must have felt something, though, and he slowly grows a beard, all things considered. Finally, it, whatever it was, stopped. She wasn't crying anymore. She no longer wanted to destroy the world. Then she remembered her friend, and she blew the standing waters away. The ark, the ark came to rest on top of a mountain. Noah had been deeply traumatized. He wasn't ready to leave the ark. So he's looking for someone among the animals to go for him. He says, one of us needs to go outside to make sure it's safe. Anyone? Kark, it was the raven. The volunteer flew back and forth above the diminishing waters and finally disappeared. Anyone else? When the dove returned bearing an olive branch, Noah knew it was time to leave the ark, but he didn't. Nope, nope, nah. -uh. Instead, he waited seven more days and sent her out again. And this time, she didn't come back. Misery is a sickness. The sickness is contagious. You catch it from the person you love. Noah caught it from God, and he's just saying, everything is okay, pull yourself together. Everything is okay, pull yourself together. 
Noah did pull himself together, at least outwardly. After everyone was safely off the ark, he built an altar on which he sacrificed one of God's favorites, the unicorn. Um, and God says, thank you, Noah. You really shouldn't. And then he's having a meltdown. Oh, Noah, please don't cry. Look, Noah. And I label the rainbow because I didn't get full color printing. Um, and he's sobbing. Listen, Noah, I stopped crying, and so must you. I will never destroy the world again. And I'm going to stop here. Thanks. Next up is this is Hello? With the Sorry. Is, where is <laughs> my present? Is any chance? Ah, magic of technology. Look at that. It's like the elections, you know? She's doing that on the board and everything. She's gonna show us how Ohio is gonna turn out. Which one is yours? Uh, there we go. You got it. There we go. All right, so now this is front and back. Yep. Uh, well, that was great. Look, I um, know Leanne a long time, and I just finished reading her book. It's wonderful. It's deep. It's insightful. It's deeply humorous. Also, when you uh, read it, and I'm really looking forward to discussion. And I say that in that I have never read another graphic novel. <laughs> But I, I figured I might actually learn a little bit about my religion. Uh, so I'm, uh, people ask me if I'm, uh, I'm Jewish, and they ask me if I'm observant, and I say, I observe Judaism from afar. <laughs> but one of the things I'm interested in is about Jews and humor. And you know, you do a Google search and you see the people, you know, it's called the people of the joke here, so what percentage of comedians are Jewish? That will, is the one that will come up. You know, amazingly uh, uh, enough, and um, you know, it turns out a lot. You know, we're we're a little bit on in it, but I'm I was born in 1944, and and really, when I was growing up, comedy was Jewish. Uh, by 1980, in, in 1980, there was a survey. 80 percent of the people in comedy, you know, were Jewish. Now, how they all got there, you know, it's probably not that the book. The book has 29 instances of laughter, and really, when God laughs, it's not a good thing for you. You know, uh, you say to God, stop me. If you've heard this one, he's going to. And uh, so, you know, where is it? The Torah, the Talmud, all the logic chopping, the thinking, whatever. Well, uh, Eastern Europe, certainly. But certainly ends up here certainly ends up in the Borscht Belt with me in 1958 with my mom and dad and these comedians. I'm, it's certainly, that's certainly a stopping place along the way. And here we have Jerry Lewis, Jerome Levitch. <laughs> uh, here we have uh, Jacob Rodney Cohn. <laughs> Buddy Hackett actually was just Leonard Hacker. I mean, I, he didn't do much with that except for the Buddy, but he did put the Hackett because Hackett is funnier than Hacker. Just like the K's are funny, the T's are funnier, okay? Uh, you got <laughs> Yaakov Mosher Masser. You've got, uh, 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 got Erwin Kninisberg, right? You just, you just can't see it working too much with everyone saying, give it up for Irwin. Kninisberg, <laughs> right? Uh, anyway, I, I grew up there. I'm exposed to jokes. And I'm Jewish, and I'm funny, and I said, oh, maybe I could do this. <laughs> and you know, jokes are hard. Jokes are very, very hard. You know, Rodney Dangerfield, you take a Rodney Dangerfield joke uh, where he always starts to says, yeah, I don't know, uh, I was in bad shape yesterday. Uh, 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 my, uh, yeah, 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 uh, uh, I told my wife, I said, uh, 
we, we need a, ho a home improvement loan. She said, gave me $1,000 to move out. <laughs> Everything about that joke is perfect. You don't want to say she gave me $1,000 to move out of home. Anything, anything, you know. Uh, I called my wife the other week. I said, I'm remembering the last time we had, had sex. I'm getting excited. She said, who is this? <laughs> OK, these are gags. They work. They're hard to do. You know, of course, it was Henny Youngman. But here's all Henny Youngman. <laughs> Originally, that, these are actually all my cartoons. <laughs> Henny Youngman never said these lines. So I'm giving you an example of the influence. All of this is uh, pushing 60 isn't the problem. It's pulling 59. You know, I don't know what I'd do without it, but I'd sure like to find out. Look, children are just a pathetic substitute for people who can't have pets. I'm a criticism of the world, but I'm based in Bayonne. So all of the... So, uh, I mean, what I really wanted to be was a comic when I grew up. But stand-up didn't even exist as, at that time as a term. And it's 58, 59, and I go to the high school of music and art, and I can draw, so I make jokes. Uh, this is my best-known joke out of the 1,000 jokes that I made. You know, I made a lot of jokes. And uh, this is the one to put my, my daughter through college, because... <laughs> It gets, re it gets reprinted a lot. You know, it's in the uh, Yale Book of Quotations, along with that other famous humorous Mao Zedong. <laughs> and when it came out in 2014, I was 70. And I thought, why don't I make some jokes about that? I'll tell you those jokes. <laughs> but I'm 78 now, so, but give, give me a, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm 70. The good news is it, 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 uh, it could be worse. The bad news is it will be. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm 70. The good news is 70 is the new 50. The bad news is dead isn't the new alive. <laughs> I'm 70, and when you're a guy and you wake up 70, you're stiff everywhere but where you want to be. <laughs> OK. So those are jokes, folks. <laughs> Here's some of my cartoons. We'll go through them, and then we'll, we'll have a talk, and we'll try. We'll try. OK. I'm sorry, dear, I wasn't listening. Could you repeat what you said since we've been married? <laughs> and, we'll let, and while there's no reason yet to panic, I think it's only prudent that we make preparations to panic. <laughs> sort of my mantra for my whole life, really, <laughs> constantly making preparations to panic. Uh, on the one hand, eliminating the middleman would result in lower costs, increased sales, and greater consumer satisfaction. On the other hand, we're the middleman. <laughs> I think all these jokes, even though they're not Jewish jokes, are really Jewish jokes to me in some way. They're, they're sort of they're thought jokes in which there's an inherent contradiction. And it starts one way and comes out the other. Uh, now, that's product placement. This isn't one of those jokes. Uh, uh, what lemmings believe. <laughs> and generally, I try to make jokes that are thoughtful, make you think a little bit about something, that this joke is not about lemmings. It might be about belief. It might think. But I'm perfectly willing to do a completely dumb and funny joke. Oh, that's not it, though. The joke was this. Look, I didn't have it. They put the one around. The joke is this. It's called. Hamlet's duplex, and there's two doors. One is saying, to be and not to be. <laughs> OK, well, I, never did a, I never did a Jewish joke at the New Yorker, because it's a long story. We can talk about that. But they, the, even though the, the, the New Yorker was run by Jews, they didn't want to be too Jewish. Uh, this is the only joke I ever did, and it's part of the book. It says, and remember, if you need everything, I'm available 24-6. OK, so this book I compiled. I asked people to do Jewish jokes. But you who are older will remember, you don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's, right? OK, anybody can do a Jewish cartoon now. Lars Kenseth, <laughs> it killed him to call. Not Jewish. <laughs> Paul Noth, not Jewish. He's all right. I just wish he were a little bit more pro-Israel. Alex Gregory, who at least looks Jewish, is not Jewish. Both christening, both Brits. <laughs> anyway, that's my deal. Let's get to the rest of the discussion. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, now I'm so that was the vision. Is this on? 
Hello? Sorry. So that was the visual material. I don't think this works, but I'll just talk loud. It does work? OK. I can't tell. Wait, wait, maybe you I are. hear you. OK, excellent. Ma um, so you're seeing two different types of Jewish humor. Um, you know, one that is a type of thought humor that, that Bob is, uh, is dealing with. And then there's Liana's, which is based in the seminal Jewish text, the Bible. Um, what but I should say, Liana also does very funny cartoons. Okay, she didn't choose to do those here, but her cartoons appear, appeared in the New Yorker, not because there were this Jewish text, but because they were but funny, because, and she continues to do it. Because you started publishing me in the New Yorker. Right. Oh, Thank actually, you. you know what, maybe before, you know, apparently you two know each other. <laughs> yes. So maybe you should mention that and, and explain yeah, well, how yeah, you did meet. And, well, and, uh, let, yeah, let me talk a little bit about that, and this is in relation to, uh, uh, it's funny because we didn't get any water, and I feel like I may in, end up doing like a, a, a reconstitute one of those New Yorker cartoons where someone is just crawling in the desert <laughs> saying, water, water. Because uh, when I asked, I said, could we get water? She said, oh, well, you have to pay. So <laughs> a very Jewish place here, I got to say that. Uh, <laughs> and there's water all around us. <laughs> water right around. Uh, so Lee Lorenz, uh, the, the art editor and the cartoon editor before me, died uh, the other day at the age of 90. And oh, this is, that's it. That is, that's a blessing. You're, a mitzvah. A uh, mitzvah, mitzvah, right. OK. Uh, and I'll even share. <laughs> I'm getting over the flu. OK. Uh, um, so he died the other day, and he was a fantastic artist, fantastic cartoonist, cartoon editor. He was my mentor. He brought me in. And so I feel very deeply about this. And I was saying to Liana that Liana is partly became in the New Yorker magazine because of Lee Lorenz, who she never met. I met him once. Met him once. <laughs> OK, met, met, him, met, met him once, but didn't really know him because one of the things Lee uh, was looking for, he was always looking for new, new talent, new artists. So even though we had a, a stable of cartoonists there, he was always on the lookout. And one of those people that he found that nobody else would have found was Roz Trast. Now we're all very, very accustomed to Roz Trast cartoons. They were not like that when she first got published, and I know Probably Liana is a student of Roz's cartoons and those that. They were very, very strange. Most people didn't even think they were cartoons. So the fact that Lee saw in Roz Chast, who was only 24 at that time, that this special something always alerted to me that, of course, I wanted really good cartoonists. I would say ordinarily great cartoonists, OK? But when Liana came in, I sensed there was something completely different there that wasn't completely formed, maybe wasn't exactly right yet, but was there. And anyway, we started publishing her, and so that, that, that's our sort of relationship from cartoons. And anyway. I, I was your intern first. <laughs> What's that? I was your intern first. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear, hear this from, I want to hear this story from Liana's side. Yeah. I want to hear your version of this yeah. story. I... Um, I, I loved, well, I didn't love New Yorker cartoons first. I loved Roz Chast first. And at the time she was doing like full pages before the back page. And so I didn't know, I wanted to do that. I didn't know anything about, oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> about the gag cartoons like that, but I They're did, tight with a dollar, but you can make them feel guilty. I did realize, I did see that there were more cartoons. There were several cartoons in each issue of the New Yorker. So I thought, like, I'll just learn how to do these, and then I'll like work my way up to doing something more sprawling. And um, I submitted maybe once every two years um, 
from the time I was 16, and I would get so mortified every time that it would take me two years to build myself back up to submitting again. And when I was 21, I got an internship for Bob's assistant um, at the New Yorker. I had shown my New Yorker cartoons at, in a critique in my art class, and one of the students told me there's an internship opening. So that's uh, one of the uh, my classmates. Um, so that's how I met Bob, and I continued to submit once every two years, very, very shy. Um, until I was 20. Well, then, I mean, in the movie, in the movie, very seriously, yes. it sort of shows you coming in and, and yeah. selling, you know, your first cartoons. Was it the Slinky cartoons? Mm -hmm. it, was the first, it was the first time I'd come in in two years, so it felt, fre I felt fresh. And it was my first time coming in since I'd graduated from college. I felt like a real grown-up. And I'd been, I was really ready to start submitting every week, and I did do it. How do you now split between you know, your lar larger projects and just the cartoons that you do? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the, they're diff really different ways of thinking. I find that for a very, for a big project like a graphic novel, you really go deep into it and I need to reserve like, m chunk, uh, like several month long chunk and do nothing else. So that involves banking cartoons and working hard on that and shoveling freelance out of the way and like finding a moment when I'm not teaching. Like I think a lot of people in our field cobbled together a career out of many little disparate things. But I I love doing I love doing cartoons because I, I I think I think pretty quickly and in little flashes and it works for me, but I love doing graphic novels because I need something to kind of escape into at all times. I need kind of an anchor. So, yeah. So one interesting thing is for your most recent book, Let There Be Light, which is an adaptation of Genesis, that's a pretty major anchor. <laughs> um, you know, that's the it anchor. Was, it was. I miss it. <clears throat> and, yeah. and, you know, what's really, I mean, I read the book, and it's fantastic. Um, you know, everything that Bob said about it is right. Uh, it's touching, it's funny, it's, it's, you know, it has depth. And one of the interesting things that you once said is that the Bible is not funny. And that, to me, is pretty accurate, but the adaptation of the Bible is, in fact, funny. And well, a, well, well, well I, I think um, Leanne is, first of all, there are things in it, of course, that are funny because you have a comic sense of timing and, and that's that. But it is also, one of the wonderful things about it is it's deeply sad. It's just very sad. I think one of the, the you know, I, I, read it, I read it this morning and, and there's a chapter called Withdrawal. So, uh, originally she, God is like, you're very there doing stuff. You know, you, 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 you're aware, and, and that's true sort of in terms of the biblical, Bob does, uh, Bob, God does this, God does, yeah, Bob, Bob does this, Bob does that. Yeah, I'm, I'm letting the cat out of the bag that I actually control a lot of things. But, the, but, 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 but then, then God sort of disappears. You know, now God doesn't show up anymore, right? Yeah, God's, well, even within the book of Genesis, like, I feel like the, the creation story, God is the main character of that story, but then as you continue on through the patriarchs, God is just kind of the impetus that makes the main characters, the patriarchs, do what they do. But she, I, I call God, she, she is not, she's not very present in the story. And there's a Kabbalistic theory that explains that, which is called Tsimtsum, which means withdrawal, which means that in order for God to to teach her creations how to be fully themselves, she has to withdraw from us. And, and that's why we don't see God, because God is letting us enact God's will um, ourselves. And also see, you know, if you're religious, oh, God is in all the creation and how everything works. And it's up for us. You have a wonderful little picture of a bird. But for me, it also made me think that 
One of the, an interesting thing about Judaism is uh, we, you don't have to believe. You know what I mean? I, I you, agree. I think like different Jews feel so differently about this. And I feel so strongly what, what you just said. Eddie, do you agree? That you don't have to, I mean, yeah, certainly. Yeah. There, it's not. Like it's not about God. But, but, but it's obvious in contrast to uh, Christianity and Jesus. Jesus, you know, you can't even be this, and you're saying, I'm accepting him as my savior into your life. You've got to actually go out and say it. You can't, and, and of course, when you look at the, 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 the atheistic tradition to the extent that exists gets you burnt <laughs> as a heretic. You, do, you can't be an atheist, and, and I don't know if it's not really prominent. It's just, as you said, there's a withdrawal. There's so much ritual. And, it, and, and in the end, it doesn't matter because you also just don't have, not, at least not in a very explicit way, heaven and hell, you know, you, which has so, so become so dominant. Without heaven and hell, yeah. it's like, well, okay, let's say there is a God, but there's no heaven or hell, and you just die. Well, it's not all that important then, is it? <laughs> there's no punishment, there's no reward. And, I think that the, the, the uh, anyway, and I sort of take that out of the, the, you know, the withdrawal, whereas you can still, I mean, I think you can be, and I, <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. I'm obviously Jewish. Everything in my head is coming from the Jewish tradition, but other than that, I have to remind you, the Talmud is what? You know, so it's like I know almost nothing about it, and yeah. and that not knowing is somehow intentional from the time I'm young. That 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 pushing it all away. When if, when I'm born in '44 in the '50s, my mother speaks Yiddish. It's not. It's something I do not want a part of, and I regret that actually. I don't regret that I let's say don't believe in God, but I regret that I don't know as Liana does about this. Right, well, you know, one of the interesting things is that, you know, the humor on which you base, you know, the Catskills Borscht Belt humor, it comes out of Yiddish. It comes out of the Yiddish humor traditions. As do, interestingly, there are um, cartoons in the Yiddish press in 1909, 1910, and, and there was a Yiddish humor magazine that had a series called uh, Illustrierte Chumash, the, you know, really? the Bible, yeah, the Bible Illustrated, yeah. and they had cartoons of things that happened in the Bible. There's also a Yiddish writer named Itzik Monger uh, who wrote something called Megillah Leader, where very similar to what you've done, uh, he recreated the Bible stories as if they took place in the shtetl. Oh, uh -huh. really? Yeah, and it's a fantastic, you know, it's, it's all it's written in great. verse and it's really brilliant. But when I was reading your book, I was very much reminded of Itzik Monger because what you've done is, and this is part of, the, you know, a lot of the humor comes from this, uh, is that you've taken some of the Bible stories and you've brought them in, into the present. And so, you know, I, this afternoon I was reading a part where, you know, uh, Abraham goes to his doorman, uh, <laughs> you know, oh, Eliezer, and, he, and yeah. he sends him somewhere to, to get something yeah. for him. And so it's, it's just like that type of scenario, um, you know, was sort of very common in, in the Yiddish press. I did that because it's a visual book and like, I guess Arkham, I mean, I don't guess, I know Arkham did a version of the book of Genesis where he like researched it very intensely and like, I, very, in my opinion, very sadly considering how hilarious Arkham is, it's a very serious book. And I, I do think the Torah is very funny, maybe because I read it in elementary school and I was kind of rolling my eyes at it in a certain way, but um, I wanted to just keep my eye on the story and the way I was reading it, and I didn't want to get bogged down in like figuring out exactly what people were wearing and like what their facial hair looked like and what a camel looks like, and um, to draw all these things is very hard, and you lose the humor if you do very, very, very hard things. Um, so that was part of the reason I wanted to set the human parts of, of this in the present. Um, the God part is kind of timeless, the creation story. And so I have, I have like the book of Genesis start in the past and move to the present and end in the future. 
Um, and it, it was a weird decision. Uh, like, I made these strange decisions, like, each of them kind of of necessity. Like, it, I was really, really wrestling with the text and trying to figure out how to relate to it, how to read it, and, and how to draw it. And so they're all kind of concrete. There are concrete reasons for each unusual decision I made. Uh, your, your drawing, you chose a very simplified drawing style. And a drawing style that sometimes is, obviously it's simplified and it's expressive, so in some you know, factual way, okay, it's wrong, things don't look like this. But sometimes it looks like you choose to make them more wrong, more wrong. In other words, the legs, you know, it's drawn very simply, but you're putting the legs a little bit weirder than they would. And is that because you're doing it a sort of all-in-one expressive kind of movement and want to get that energy? Or are you making like conscious choices for more, more simplification, more distortion? Or is it simply coming out of the almost uh, uh, calligraphic way in which your, 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 you know, your narrative is unfolding? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I want to see which legs you're talking about. But... Um, <laughs> I do think that it's, I think of comics and cartoons as a form of writing. And so I do try to draw as someone else would write. I, I want my drawings to be more like handwriting than like um, decoration. And I, you're one of the people I studied in this. I think you do this. Well, uh, yeah, and I think it's the right decision because, it, because w w probably one of the reasons I have difficulty with graphic novels is they're so graphic. <laughs> it's just too much drawing. You know, there's just too much going on in each panel. It's like, okay, this whole panel is, cog is a kind of cognitive work. And it's sort of, which, you know, I grew up with comic books, which is actually a very hot, by the time I was reading them, a very high form of art. Anybody who could draw a comic Superman and these superhero art could really draw. And but, and so you had complicated pictures that were narrow, but they were very short. It's not 500 pages of, of this. So I think it really uh, works. Uh, I mean, I, I think it does really work well. And I don't know, is it unique to you or is it part of a little, a little bit of part of the zeitgeist of the, the uh, I mean, a lot of, uh, for example, uh, the cartoonist Abby Steinberg does a lot of things in which they're very simple, almost stick figures that very quickly get the idea across. And yet, and even though they're only stick figures, and e even though your drawings are simple, they seem to have a lot of poignancy. And sometimes I think things have more feeling and poignancy when the viewer puts it into them rather when, when the artist does all the work. Totally. Yeah. You, you know, I could just point out that as a viewer and as a non-artist, um, one of the things that I've noticed about your work is that the text is almost like a character. Your lettering is, I love your lettering, and it's really interesting, and the letters themselves have a kind of movement that you don't see in a lot of other cartoons. Um, and I think that, you know, what's, it, what's also interesting about that is the New Yorker, and I think this sort of, sim this sort of pared down style, I think, is more common to the New Yorker. You don't really see a lot of cartoons. I mean, maybe Edward Corrin's cartoons have a lot of happening, but there's, a, you know, it's a, you have one panel to do it, and so there's a simplicity to it um, that, you know, you won't find in a graphic novel where, you know, people sort of feel like they, they have a lot more space to work. Um, well, it's interesting, Lee who, Lee, who died recently himself, was a very accomplished uh, uh, artist. And if you look at Lee Lorenz's cartoons from 58 and 59 for the New Yorker and Esquire, he comes from a painting background. They're not illustrated, but they're quite worked out. You're, you're watching someone who can really paint and really work wash and everything. He simplifies the style almost in a Japanese way. In the, in the end, but he, uh, in, which, in which I was saying to Liana, I knew Lee, and he would, he was, a, he was the art editor, the cartoon editor, he would have on his lap, he would have his washes and his brush, and really, and he would underpaint in wash, 
a whole complicated scene and then quickly, quickly do it. And he was also a jazz performer. Now, that kind of art doesn't exist anymore. It's, it, uh, it's, it's not that it shouldn't, it just can't. Every, any more than you have like the big band era of the 40s or 50s or the kind of virtuoso performance. You know, no one's gonna ever tap dance again like Fred Stair and Gene Kelly. They can tap dance, but it, 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 you know, so, so that was that moment. But Lee collected African art. His interest in art was in these simple strong forms. The, the, the generation that he brought in was, he, he didn't ask, which is another tribute to him, he wasn't asking that people did what he did. He was looking for what was coming down the line. And I think that's, what, that's the way it's, a, that's the, I mean, art and, and music and humor always uh, evolved when, <laughs> You know, when I took over, I'm sure it's the same with them, and when I took over, people used to say, well, the New Yorker cartoons aren't as good as they used to be. And I would say, you know, they never were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's really the nature, you know, of, of, you know of, of the situation. I like what you're saying about ink wash, like, like that, like brush and ink wash not being the same as they were, like, in, in the 40s or something, because they were cool and like they there there was like a new cool vibe to them that you you pinpointed it yeah right they, now it's like kind of precious they were also being influenced by their times when in the new yorker in the 30s and 40s always has artists who do their ideas but they also have gag writers so peter arno does not come up with his lines so it's a combination going back to punch in the 1890s and 1880s these are very elaborate drawings. It's, it's too complete. They're completely separated. So did he the, choose his jokes though? Because what's that? Did Peter Arno choose his jokes? Which one? Peter Arno. Yeah. Yeah, eh, I don't like him. <laughs> you don't like him? Oh, because of the sexist part so of it. Sexist but, and like fussy. He's fussy. No, I don't think it's fussy. I don't think if you look at the strong, his strongest drawings, it is fussy. Because, uh, but the way Peter Arno actually did, he did draw it over and over again, but in the end, you can read Michael, Michael Maslin's book about this. He did do it in the end with these strong uh, things. And also there are, you know, we, I guess we disagree. You know, there's a famous cartoon which has the caption, well, back to the old drawing board, which comes from the Peter Arno cartoon. And if you watch the construction of that cartoon, it's a perfect kind of compositional construction. So I do think that everything has to be evaluated within its own time and era. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't make any, you know, because I, I think we always suffer from what I call chronocentrism. It's our time. And our time then is, becomes the touchstone from well, all times or that. So, I mean, I like to be able to appreciate everything, except the things I hate, of course, <laughs> which I'm right about. Well, you know, one of the, one of, one of the interesting th things is that, you know, cartoons are obviously topical. And, you know, if you look at a cartoon from 100 years ago, you may not understand it at all. Uh, you know, you may not think it's funny, it may be offensive, it, you know, everything, you know, culture constantly evolves and changes, and as a result, you know, old cartoons often are not, you know, particularly interesting to people. But, you know, one, one of the interesting things you said earlier about gags, and how all of your gag cartoons are sort of like Henny Youngman bits, um, you know, it seems like so much of that is, you know, Henny Youngman's obviously this Jewish character, and, and you know he's doing Jewish Catskill Borscht Belt bits, and um, you know that's this Jewish component to the humor that's not, you know, obvious. I mean, it's not you're not dealing with Genesis, but you're dealing with life in general. But you have a sort of Jewish mean, a Jewish attitude that you know allows you to create these gags. Well, you know, I mean, there's so many threads to this and to this history. It's not just Yiddish, it, it, it's the Talmud, it's Eastern Europe, it's the, it's, the, it, uh, it's the assimilationist Jews, it's the Hasidic Jews, it's all of this. It's a, it's a thinking culture. 
and it's an overthinking culture. Any culture that does something over and over again will start to parody itself. So the Talmud, this thinking, this crazy thinking about thinking, so many Jewish jokes have that feeling. They, you know, when, when uh, 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 Freud writes like the original humor analysis joke, jokes in their relation to the unconscious. And in it, he has mainly Jewish jokes. And they always have like a turn back on themselves. So the marriage broker brings the bride to the groom and uh, the groom comes over and she says, what, what, what have you brought me? She's got a humpback. She limps, she's blind in one eye. The broker says, you don't, you, you don't have to whisper, she's deaf too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is, this is 1905, and that joke is not from 1905, that joke is before then. That joke comes out of this, there are schnorrers, there are marriage brokers, that whole world, and that whole world is infused with humor. The people in that world are funny, and those jokes come out of it. They emigrate. They emigrate to the United States during vaudeville, okay? So for the first time, you can really be funny for money. And that also intersects with Jewish culture. Okay, this is a way this is a way, and it's, transform it's been transformed again. So originally it's transformed through, hey, you know what? You get paid for jokes, because the United States by 1900 is a culture where you make money by selling jokes. For cartoons, for making jokes. You know, why, why does Woody Allen not go to high school and stuff? Because he can write 50 jokes on the, on the subway on the way to this place, he, and already he's making $1,500 you know, a week. But this happens again, interestingly, in the 70s and 80s, but in a different way. The Jews start getting educated. They start going to Harvard and Brown and Yale, and they start becoming on the Harvard Lampoon. They start the National Lampoon. They become showrunners. They become comedy writers. They become the John Stewarts. They, so they move to a, a different level where all these guys are smart. Henny Youngman isn't dumb, nor any of these Borscht brothers. They're not educated. They become educated, and now you see this, really, I think, other level of Jewish influence in, you know, in, in culture. The problem is, I always think, is whenever a comedian thinks, oh, besides being funny and sort of smart, I'm basically just smart. <laughs> and that's when they start like preaching or telling you, whether it's Jon Stewart or anyone else. And then I say, well, I don't really need you to tell me <laughs> you know, about that. So do, so do you think that a, um, a cartoonist is sort of a more artistic comedian? They're, they're all different kinds. I mean, I, I, I mean they're, they're all different kinds. I do think that it's in a broader framework. A comic person just looks at the world for its absurdities. That's it. We just want to make the jokes. Right. I mean, Liana, do you just you know, where do you think your humor, I mean, Bob's obviously comes from a more traditional comedy world. No, it totally rings true. I think, I do think cartoonists are comedians who are dry. Uh, well, I think they are, but they're different kinds, and right? Writers they're are different comedians. kinds. They're satirists. They're people, editorial cartoonists, who essentially are... Right, those, hope, what yeah. are those? What's that? The, I don't know if those are comedians. <laughs> I don't think you're right, they're not. Well. But they're, I guess what you mean by a comedian, that like for, I did write a little something about George Booth, who was a humorist. And a humorist is someone whose humor has compassion. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's not a joke writer. He's not a joke yeah, writer, right. he's, a, he's a humorist. He, yeah. he, and when you look at the history of these terms, wit and humor, they're very, very different in the 19th century. Wit is being clever. Wit is even being insulting. Wit is cutting someone up. Humor comes from character. So you look at all George Booth's cartoons and the humor of character. We're, we're, we're empathizing with the foibles of the human condition. He's not a joke writer, but not. He, he could have been a comedian of a different sort. Well, he could have been sort of like a, like a folksy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, no. he was that also, although, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Um, so unfortunately, we're running a little short on time, but we do have some time to take questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, uh, please feel free. Well, my one interaction with Adams at my time in New York, two interactions in a way. One was he was there once and I shook his hand. Okay, that's my interaction because he didn't come in and he was large and he had a large hand. That, so that's, I can give you, there's no question I can't that. My other interaction peripherally was when I started with the New Yorker, they were buying gags for Charles Adams. Charles Adams originally created his material, but as he got older, like everybody else, he became less uh, creative or whatever. Anyway, the New Yorker at that time still was buying gags. So I submitted this, I, I, was, I, I was showing my cartoons to Lee and he, he <laughs> He said, um, I, we'd like to buy this for Charles Adams. And I said, I'd like you not to. <laughs> I mean, I, I will say the difference is I always did stand up for myself. I wasn't gonna, I said, this is what I do. I do the jokes. I don't, I, I don't wanna do that. Now this is interesting in another way because Steve Martin, who now does cartoons with Harry Bliss, sometimes they appear in the New York and they got a book, was actually giving some lines to Michael Crawford, the late Michael Crawford, who died a while ago, but it was anonymous. And then he said, I, um, you know, when he went started to work with Harry, I want, I want credit for it. So uh, Charles Adams is a, he's an, it, it, an interesting thing to me about Charles Adams is this. And this is in distinction to uh, Liana. And, and maybe a general distinction I think might be interesting. You think that from Charles Adams, you know something about who Charles Adams is. You know nothing about him. He's not morbid, he's not macabre, he's not, you know, whatever. There were all crazy stories about Charles Adams, you know, having to go into psychiatric institutions. Once, uh, Jack Ziegler was a great cartoonist. He did very zany cartoons. And David Remnick once asked me, you know, what is he smoking? I said, nothing. Jack drinks an occasional beer. You know nothing about Jack. With Roz, and it's not just true of women cartoonists, that changed. Yeah, we smoke a lot of weed. What's that? We smoke a lot. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, they're constantly. I mean, they, yeah. they, they do hard <laughs> stuff, too. But you know something, you, you know something about them. And, and so there is a difference between exteriority, right, and assuming you know something about someone in interiority. And one of the ways about cartoons have changed is that I honestly don't think you know too much about me from my cartoons. You might think you do. You might think it's funny or whatever, but you really don't know about me. I think you know more about Roz, about, you know, more about David Cypress, you know, his political opinions, you know a lot. And probably know something about other, other cartoonists. You probably know something. So there are cartoonists who are doing these things which are, they're expressing themselves, and then there are cartoonists who are looking out at the world in a comic way and manipulating it, and you know, that's their attack. Like I don't, like you don't know anything about, anything about Rodney Dangerfield from those jokes. Zero. He's not, it's not about his marriage. It's a person, it's a complete persona. Yeah? Can you speak up a bit? Yeah, you're a generation off. You can't do anything about that. You can, that's it. You just I mean, stay in your lane. <laughs> you're a generation. Yeah, that's the, the I, mean, I mean, that's it, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's like, and there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. There's nothing wrong. We, we, we just, we go through this, 
this veil of tears and laughter the way we do. And we like to, hey, when, when I put on Spotify, I'm, I'm listening to my songs that I want to hear again. I don't, you know, I mean, that's, that's just life. <laughs> yeah, you're no longer the target audience for Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Well, Leanna would be better uh, to understand that, especially for something like uh, like her her graphic novel. With cartoons, it was more or less a selection process. You're getting thousands of cartoons. You're sort of picking them, and so you you really pick. Sometimes you give a little feedback. But I know I was reading your acknowledgments. You know, you were dealing with with with, with a number of editors, right? I mean, yeah, with cartoons, there isn't much editing. There's choosing and. One second. <coughs> with um, with graphic novels, it really depends if you're published by a comics publisher <coughs> or a literary publisher. Um, I'm with a literary publisher, and my editor mostly just deals with. <coughs> Here's some water. <coughs> That's the wisdom of age, <coughs> right there. That's the kind of experience that you, there's no substitute for that kind of experience. Um, my editor mostly just deals with, um, so I'm kind of left on my own in terms of the drawing. And it's an interesting place to be. I'm sorry I'm so quiet. It's okay, we'll, get, we'll <coughs> take a break. Over here. There's a wonderful book called The Haunted Smile about Jewish comedians and their need to be certainly not too Jewish and, and how they had to navigate in the 30s and 40s, you know, World War II, all of, all of this. You know, Jack Benny, uh, George Burns, you know, they're all Jewish. It's important that they be not perceived as a Jewish. For Eddie Cantor sort of failed in the movies because he was too New York, too Jewish. Seinfeld originally is a show that they're wary about putting on because it's too New York, right? But it's really too Jewish. And, but of course what's happened is that the uh, I mean, John Stewart that's, is not, that's not his name either, so it's, it's interesting how that, and, uh, and all that sort of went away, and now I feel with anti-Semitism, it's sort of all come back. Because I, I went through, I, for my, during my life, I was hoping for a little anti-Semitism to come my way. Because I really had none, you know what I mean? I felt like, oh, damn, it's not can't, that, it's not that can't great. someone, I mean, yeah, honestly, but I feel this in a way. You know what I mean? Here you had my parents born in 1907, 1908, who couldn't work at jobs and couldn't do anything. You have the Holocaust in which, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with me, but, every, but there are people on my block in Queens who have the numbers and stuff like that. So I'm very, it, it's just weird in that my life is not, is, is not in any way affected were certainly not hampered in any way by being Jewish. And, and honestly, I thought this is a little bit, you know, uh, you know, okay, this, is, this thing is overblown, you know, essentially, because we're doing really well and whatever. Uh, and there was a joke I always like, which is, and I think there's a truth to it, it doesn't just have to do with Jews, was anti-Semitism is, like, is disliking Jews more than necessary. 
is disliking Jews more than necessary. And I like that because it is a wonderful truth to that. We all have resentments and irritations to other groups. I mean, somebody comes by in a car and the boom thing is on so loud and you feel like, oh, I don't, you know, okay, but it doesn't animate you. There's no hate involved. It's something that's just sort of like, oh, I'm not crazy about that. And, but now I feel, oh, I mean, we see it when we come in here, you know, there's all this security and, you know, whatever. So it is once again a, you know, <laughs> it's such a terrible and ridiculous thing. I, you know, it's hard to get your head around why, it's not hard. I mean, Eddie, you would know about, I mean, there's a million books of like, why the Jews? Maybe it's because, <laughs> I would say, you know, if we had the whole thing over again, we would say to God, choose somebody else. <laughs> there's, there's next week's cartoon. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah choose somebody else. <laughs> right. Did, Adelaide, are you able to get back to the answer about the editors? Or, uh... Oh, I answered it just very, very quietly. I'll say it louder. But um, I have a really, really good editor who's a prose editor, and I think he feels shy. Uh, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't feel equipped to do images, so I'm kind of, I'm not really edited in my images. I'm edited the way a writer would be, but also I think I've, I've hardly been edited in my whole career a, a ton. I think people don't quite know what to do with a hybrid person unless you're at a very specifically niche hybrid publisher, which I never have been. No. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, you do, you do, you do, you do, uh, of course, because it has material consequences to you. I think people have, uh, there's two things really. One is that human doesn't have much of an influence. Everybody wants to say it has an enormous influence on society. And like that, humor. You, you know, I, you know, I'm like, oh, <coughs> satire. Is. Microphone, microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, that's, it is, it's such a powerful force. It's not a powerful force. Uh, 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 you know, uh, Peter Cook, or Peter Cook and Dudley Moore were asked about, about well, don't you think satire is, po is powerful? And he said, yeah, all, all those clever cafes in Berlin certainly stopped Hitler in his tracks. You know, tr all the satire did nothing about Trump. Okay, it didn't affect it one bit. So we're overrating sort of the, the function of humor as somehow changing things. It doesn't change. It should be, you know, used personally. My view of it is this. There's secret humor in your head. I can think whatever I want and I will, <laughs> okay? Uh, there's private humor where you're just talking to, you know, somebody and you feel safe and, you know, you can be a little bit outrageous. You can be bad, just like bad, right? You can be bad. Be uh, uh, George Orwell said something interesting and I believe he said, jokes don't corrupt us, they just show we are corrupted. We are corrupt. And then there's public humor now, which is fraught, as is discussion. And you don't want to get involved in that because there's, it's just a no-win situation uh, to, to start to deal with that. Unless, and then I think you should, you're a person who, is, who, who will stand up because, they, because they, they, they want to stand up, they want to say something, and they feel they can say something. And someone like that would be Dave Chappelle where he feels that he actually, I don't feel Dave Chappelle is, you, I disagree with him or whatever, is saying things to offend. He is trying to say, this is what I feel. And this is sort of important because we are, by tamping down on humor and everything, we're actually just blinding ourselves to what people actually think. We're just blinding ourselves. They're still thinking it. They're still having the exact same effect. We're papering over, over it. So yeah, it's, it's so many cartoons I did in The New Yorker I, could never appear now. They weren't terribly, I mean, 
I did a cartoon in 1996 where there's a guy, an old fuddy duddy guy. He's got a magnifying glass and he's, he's looking down a woman's blouse. And he said, you'll have to excuse me, I'm a breast buff. Okay. And, that sounds like accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this kind of thing, and I did that. But how I, did you draw the breasts? Like, uh, I no, feel like it, it's only, Arno would have like, No, they're really only, it's only cleavage. It's only cleavage. So, 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 oh, just even saying the word is exciting. But the, <laughs> my, but the, but, but the reason I did it is, uh, I remember how it came about. Uh, I was in an elevator with a guy who was somehow pressing different buttons as an experiment of some sign, and he was saying, you have to excuse me, I'm trying to see if you know, something could happen. And I thought, oh, that's a weird thing where you, know, you could start to say, you'll have to excuse me, and then you're doing something bizarre. And, and so as a joke writer, I just wanted to think of something strange you know, stupid. Also, I remember I did a cartoon in which a, 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 a politician is giving a speech and he's black and he says, and if I'm elected, I promise to put more black people in cartoons. <laughs> okay, so that would never go now. And all those cartoons were okay by David Remnick, who, you know, so it wasn't but like But there this. weren't black people in cartoons back then, so you were pointing out something I was pointing, true. I was pointing that out, but one of the things that happened now is people can't look to see what the joke means anymore. They just see the, the topic that you're talking about, and they say that is a topic that should not be talked about, should not be mentioned, or it's too, it's too, it's too important for jokes to be made about. And I don't really think that there's any topic that is too important to make, and, and, and honestly, Oh, you know, people would say I was offended by that joke or cartoon, right? And then I would ask them, and then what happened? <laughs> and then I said, were you able to have lunch? A restless night sleeping? Well, oh, it turns out nothing happened. Turns out you, that was it. That's where it ended. You were offended. So how does that become like the ultimate criteria for how we run our society? Two, I talked to a lot. Right, well, people love to be affected. So. Yeah, right. So unfortunately, we're out of time. Please join me in thanking Leanna Fink and Bob Mankoff. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie.